in three, two. Good afternoon. I, Jane Lichter, now call to order the meeting of the Equity Committee for Thursday, January 19th, 2023. On behalf of Dr. Savoy, Chair of the Equity Committee, I will be presiding over today's meeting. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the Chair of a Committee at their discretion and after consultation with the Staff Liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding, seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Fast, please call the roll of board members to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Dr. Savoy. I read her lips, she said present. Okay, is she her, she's muted, but I did see her say present. Miss um, Harvey. And Miss Lichter. Present. Thank you. Ms. Fast, please call the role of staff members on the committee participating in today's meeting. Dr. Yarborough. Present. And Mr. Handy. Present. Thank you. Ms. Fast, please call and note the names of any additional staff members participating in the meeting. Ms. Hernandez. Present. Dr. Sullivan. Present. Thank you. Good afternoon. This is Megan Shea. I'm also here today. Sorry, and Ms. likewise, Shea. Dr. McComas is also present. Committee chairs will facilitate discussion by calling off names of committee members to speak in turn. Committee members will also acknowledge they have a question by calling on the chair, then saying their name. Staff members will answer any questions posed by committee members by saying their name first, then speaking. Staff members that want to add any discussion may call on the chair to speak, then saying their name. If the chair calls for any motions, the committee member will move and say their name, and a second committee member will second and say their name. The chair will then state, may I have a roll call vote? Assistance will speak each committee assistance will speak each committee member for their vote and record appropriately for the ETA. Okay. So we're ready to start. Thank you first um, staff for your patience as we navigated getting a quorum present. So our first um, piece is the English for speakers of other language. Um, PowerPoint and presentation so that I think I'm turning it over to Dr. Mr. Handy and Ms. Hernandez and Dr. Sullivan, correct? Yes, thank you, Ms. Lecter. There you go. All right, so um, for this evening's presentation, um, I offer this to you, Ms. Lecter, and to you, Dr. Savoy, and also uh, anyone, you know, observing this meeting. These are our equity lens questions. So they were developed by the Maryland Association of Boards of Education. And as we bring topics to this committee, um, I'd like us to consider these five questions and, and frame our thinking and our reflection on the presentations through uh, these five questions. So um, they're on the slide here. They're actually also on uh, my department's website. You can get them straight from MABE. And there's also um, some printed copies um, throughout BCPS. So we will you know, revisit this as we go forward through the presentation. But again, I'd like you all to uh, use these as a frame uh, for which you view and consider uh, the presentation um, on ESOL. All right, at this point, um, I do want to turn it over to uh, Dr. Yarborough for any comments before I turn it over to our uh, presenters. Thank you, Mr. Handy. Um, again, I want to uh, welcome everyone as well. And as uh, Mr. Handy said, those questions that we are using to uh, frame will help us in this conversation with our uh, curriculum instruction colleagues around how we serve our English language learners. Um, and we also have planned today to uh, introduce possible future topics for upcoming meetings. Uh, so at this time, I would turn it over to uh, Dr. McComas so she can introduce uh, our colleagues from CNI to begin. 
Thank you, Dr. Yarborough and Mr. Handy. So welcome everyone to our first equity committee as our new uh, committee um, membership. Um, our team here today represents our ESOL uh, leadership. Um, so ESOL office is within the office of uh, ESOL and World Languages. Uh, our coordinator is Dr. Aaron Sullivan. Aaron, if you could say hi. Good afternoon. She is our um, central expert on ESOL. Uh, she is within the Office of ESOL and World Languages, which is led by our director, uh, Ms. Hernandez, if you could introduce yourself. Hi, good afternoon. And that sits within the Department of Teaching and Learning, uh, which is led by our executive director, Ms. Shea. Good afternoon. And then that is all part of our division of CNI, which um, I have the honor of, of leading. So today what we'd like to do is introduce you to our context of our English language learners. Uh, and so there's a good bit of content information we'd like to walk through uh, for two purposes. One, to help uh, orient you to the landscape around our multilingual learners and our English language learners specifically, but then also to use um, this as a student group by which we are constantly paying attention to um, using our equity lens to pay attention to how we are serving them and how better to serve them to ensure that uh, they don't have disparate outcomes. Um, and so I'm going to hand it over to the team. We're going to walk through. Please at any point stop and interrupt us. Uh, we hope our goal here is to use our equity lens questions to start developing that habit of using those questions as we're looking at this student group. So I'll turn it over to the team to walk us through. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. McComas. Um, Mr. Corns, we can go to the next slide. So um, good afternoon, Chair Lichter and Committee Chair Savoy. We are so grateful to have the time here today um, to share with you about our multilingual learners. And so as Dr. McComas said, um, we wanted to, uh, this is our agenda for what we want to share. We know that it's a lot of information and we will move uh, slow through certain parts and then a little quicker through others. But uh, we believe this is a really important topic for us to help um, engage our board members with because of all the work you do to support our system. And so we want to start by really defining our multilingual learners. And we're going to talk a little bit around vocabulary. Um, I'm still a teacher, and so I like to always start with front loading that vocabulary that's going to help you navigate the conversation because our multilingual learners are not a monolith. They come to us with incredibly diverse backgrounds and levels of experience, all of which informs some of the instructional planning and the needs we have as a system in terms of supporting them. Uh, so we're going to talk exactly about what's the current status, how do we currently serve our English learners, our multilingual learners, and then uh, what does that look like from a curriculum standpoint, pro professional learning, um, and data. Who are our English learners and um, how are they being serviced in schools? And then we want to talk to you about where we're going. Um, this is really important work and important timing because of our ESOL strategic plan about how we serve our multilingual learners, especially in our secondary schools. Um, and it's also very timely because you have in front of you the superintendent's budget presentation and some of what we'll talk about with ESOL today will hopefully help frame your decisions um, regarding that budget. Next slide. And so uh, the first thing that you will note when we're talking about um, language is you've heard me and it's still a transition for all of us. Um, we are trying to encourage the use of the term multilingual learners. And the reason that we're making that shift from what is traditionally and still from a data standpoint is still you'll very often see our students referred to as English learners. So we still do see that term and use it. But we are trying to move towards the language of multilingual learners because it reflects our asset based mindset. So instead of centering the deficit of that which they don't know, we referring to them as multilingual learners really reframes it as an asset. These are students who are going to be bilingual and in some cases trilingual, which is an incredible asset in the 21st century for our globally competitive graduates. Uh, you'll hear some of us use the terms interchangeably because it is a shift that we're trying to model and you'll also see see sometimes in state data reporting and other resources that these students are referred to as English learners. So it's certainly not a term that's gone away, but I just wanted to be intentional about why the shift and what we're hoping to promote by using that language. Next slide. And so as I mentioned, you will see these reported um, and defined by the state as L's. 
Um, and what this means is that these are students. We have a home language survey that's a part of our um, registration process that helps keys us in to know that these are students that could be potentially identified as English learners. And that survey um, asks if students speak a language other than English at home and if that is their primary language. We then use a screener assessment, the WIDA screener, to determine whether or not a student would qualify for ESOL services. Um, and as I mentioned again, we um, use a lot of different language terms here, all of which are a part of reframing that with an asset based mindset. Next slide. We also, you'll see reported in our data and have a responsibility to serve what we call our reclassified English learners or RELs. And what that means is um, at the state level, if you score at a 4.5 on a six point scale of proficiency, you are determined to have exited ESOL services. However, as I mentioned, the goal is to get all the way to proficiency, but once a student has reached a score of 4.5, they can be exited from receiving that direct service. It is our responsibility to continue to monitor these students and their progress for two years after being exited, and that is to make sure that they continue to make and demonstrate that level of proficiency. And so typically these are students who have exited ESOL within the last two years because that lines up with the monitoring um, length of time, um, and that's again after exiting. So oftentimes when you look at data, you'll see students reflected as our current English learners, as well as our reclassified English learners. It's an important data point when we share with you some of our achievement data because we also want to illustrate that uh, many of our reclassified English learners, once they have met with success, actually go on to perform very, very well in across contents. And that's important to note as well. Um, the students that we serve in Baltimore County are extremely talented. Um, they're just learning a new language. And so sometimes reporting that data both ways can show that, and you'll see that hopefully in today's presentation as well. Next slide. And then we have students who are ever else, and that's our way of classifying was this student ever in their um, history in BCPS an active English learner during their school education. So they have fully exited, meaning they're no longer in that two year um, monitoring. So they're fully exited, but at one point in their school career, um, they were identified as an English learner. Again, this helps us to um, tell the full narrative about our English learners and how they go on to achieve very high level of outcomes. Uh, we have several student members of the board, um, former and other um, rock star student graduates of BCPS who were in EverL or who were at one time identified as receiving services. Um, but that's another classification that we use to tell the full story of our ESOL program in BCPS. Next slide. And then as I mentioned, when we do our home language survey, that's to give us an idea of who may qualify for ESOL service. And so when they are registered at our schools, they do complete that as part of the registration process. And so there are certain triggers in that screener that let us know that they either speak in their home or are exposed to a language other than English. And so as I mentioned, then the next step is for us to screen them. We do have some students that when we use that screener, they already score at that level in which they would not qualify for ESOL service. That's important for us to also recognize because it still means that they're working in a bilingual environment and may have needs specific to working um, and learning in our context. And so um, we also report on that as well. Next slide. And so here's our current status, and Dr. Sullivan's going to talk a little bit more about who our multilingual learners are in terms of country and language and, and, and grade level. Um, but we currently have 11,340 students that are um, classified as L's, meaning they are currently actively um, receiving services in ESOL. We have 1,607 students that are in that two year window where they have exited within the last two years, and we're continuing to monitor them and 3,103 students who have fully exited. So these might be students who are in our upper grades that maybe we served in the primary grades. So they're still with us in BCPS, um, but they are no longer in that two-year monitoring window. And then you'll see we do have a high number of students that we tested but did not qualify. And again, that's important because they're not receiving services, but they are still um, living in that multilingual environment, which can have an impact on their proficiency and their acquisition of other skills. So 
So next slide. So that was just a little vocabulary primer to help understand, you know, there's a lot that goes into our multilingual learners. And as I mentioned, they are not a monolith, just like all of our student groups, um, but they do have unique needs. And so I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Sullivan. She is our ESOL coordinator, and she's going to talk a little bit about how we, um, who are our current L's that you saw reflected in that 11,000 number, and how do we currently serve them? Dr. Sullivan? Thank you, Megan. <clears throat> So the first slide, uh, next slide, Jim. So um, one of the things that, and I think this might have an animation, Jim. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, so <laughs> what you will see, and so the number that Megan just referenced was the most up-to-date number, 11,320. Um, this is to show you the growth over time of our English learner population, but what I would, the 11,063 is our official October 31st number. So since October 31st, we've gained almost um, about 300 students in that short amount of time. Um, and um, we'll talk about Welcome Center data in a little bit, but you'll see our Welcome Center data is um, pretty high for this year. And so we imagine that that number is just going to really continue to grow this year quite a bit. Um, which is a really important thing to know that our population continues to grow quite a bit throughout the school year, which has its own um, opportunities and challenges. The growth, I also the growth, I, a lot of you have heard this from the superintendent has been over 225% in the past 10 years. Next slide. So this is also, um, I was also a teacher. <laughs> this is also a little bit of an um, academic lesson. So um, we just want to make sure that in terms of proficiency, and Megan uh, explained it quite well, that we exit at a 4.5. But, uh, I, and again, there are those six levels in under WIDA. One is the lowest proficiency and um, six is the highest. And we are exit strictly on a 4.5 criteria. Um, what you'll see is we have a lot over 50% of our English learners are at that entering or beginning level, which is not uncommon. Um, we most of our students, you know, come in at a pretty low level. Um, and so you'll see that. And then we have few at the four level, but it's only four to 4.4 that would make them an active English learner. After that point, they would be a reclassified English learner. Next slide. Here um, is English learner information around grade level. This is really important. Um, typically, our K group um, it is one of our highest, and you'll see our second grade is quite high right now. Um, but our kindergarten, every year we gain, we've been gaining over a thousand students just at the kindergarten level. Um, and most of these students were born in this country, um, and are, but they are in a home where another language is spoken. Um, you'll see another spike in, so what you're seeing in hopefully in third and fourth and fifth that the curve is starting to go down. We know that it takes five to seven years to learn a language, a second language. Um, and so you're starting to see kids exit. Um, at the same time, there's new growth in those grades as well. So um, ninth grade, you'll see a spike. Um, a lot of our students who come in after the age of 14, are um, placed in ninth grade because in order to be in 10th, 11th, or 12th, you have to have certain um, credits, including English and American government, which um, most of our students do not have in order to move to 10th. So um, even if they have credits from their other country, a lot of times they're, they're first put in the ninth grade. And we do have a lot of students who, even though they're older, they have had gaps in their education, so they will be placed in ninth grade also. Next slide. Okay, so as I mentioned before, we have a large number of students who are born in this country. Um, so almost um, about 50% of our students are American born. Um, and then after that, you'll see Honduras is next, El Salvador, Gu El Salvador and Guatemala. That um, Northern Triangle is is um, makes up our largest group. A lot of people think that we have a lot of students from Mexico. We do not comparatively. Um, 
we also have a larger Nigerian population. And I, we have a larger Nigerian population than this represents. This represents the active English learners who qualified for ESOL services. Many of our Nigerian students do not qualify for ESOL services because their academics um, in their country is also in English. Um, languages are always kind of fun. When I first came, Burmese was the second most spoken, um, so it kind of goes back and forth, but Arabic and Urdu kind of trend. Um, they kind of go back and forth. So Urdu is a language mostly spoken in Pakistan. Arabic is spoken in many places around the world, but obviously Spanish is that blue. Um, we've had a growing number um, percentage of Spanish speakers. So when I first came in 2015, 55% of our population were Spanish speaking. Now it's about 68%. Next slide. So then we um, are going to talk about ESOL waivers. So we've been talking about uh, students who are English learners, so who have um, spoken another language at home and qualified for ESOL services. Um, but families have an option of um, opting out of ESOL services. And so we see um, a lot of waivers, and we'll discuss why. Um, when students waive services, they're still considered an active L by the state. We still are required to test them every year. We're still required to, until they exit, we still are required to give them assessment accommodations, but they're not receiving the e English services. Next slide. So this is um, the current, so our current number of ESOL waivers for the system is 1,357, which is a, a high number of students and families who are saying, um, we know that the assessment said that our child needs English, but no thank you. And, um, and back in uh, 17, 18, it was only 250. So you can see that rise. There was a considerable spike also after the pandemic. I think when, when kids were at home um, and then we came back. Um, so next slide. Okay, so we're gonna talk about who waives ESOL services. So of that number, you'll, um, and so the graph on the left, um, you'll see that there are the smaller levels that don't even have, aren't even marked. They are all of the elementary grades. So at the elementary level, we have very few students families waiving services. Very few families who are saying, I don't want ESOL services. But in sixth grade, you'll see we have 251 students right now. And that is, has been reported to us by parents is because right now we're offering ESOL services in a center model and the parents do not want to send their child to the center to receive the services. And they've given multiple reasons. One is transportation, one is reputation of the center. There are multiple reasons, but the smallest reason has been that they don't want the service, that they don't think their child needs the service. They think the child needs their, the English service, but they're not willing to put their child on a bus for an hour to go receive those services elsewhere. So that's why you'll see that large spike in sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. It kind of carries on um, throughout those secondary years. So at the secondary level, our services are being provided at either four middle school centers or five high school centers. Um, and so that's the only option for the families to receive ESOL services in, at this time. Um, one of the other trends that has been uh, upsetting um, is that we are starting to see some ones and twos waiving services. Um, when I first arrived, it was mostly students who were fours, maybe threes, but you can see we have students who are at the lowest proficiency level who are not receiving any ESOL services in Baltimore County right now because the parents have chosen to waive services. Next slide. Um, I talked about this a little bit, um, how one, our foreign-born students have increased. So while we have a large amount of um, of Americans in the system in the past couple of years, our foreign born has started to, to increase. Um, our Spanish speaking population has increased. Um, it looks like it's starting to shift down a little bit, but that's significant. I will say um, uh, nationally, English learner population is about 80% Spanish speaking. So being at 68% shows that we still have a lot of other diversity within Baltimore County. 
we had that growing Nigerian population, um, and we've had a tremendous growth in the um, non-L immigrants, so students who come to us, um, and this is very much um, associated with, with the Nigerian population, students who come to us who are immigrants, they're here for less than three years, but they don't need the ESOL services. Um, and we've been receiving a lot of additional funding, grant funding from the state, um, because we have those students in, in Baltimore County. Um, and our percentage of long-term L's, so students who have been in ESOL for more than five years has started to increase um, from that six to almost 10%. So that's something that we're, is part of our plan is to try to address the needs of the long-term English learners. Next slide. So here is some data for here. Sorry, I'm sorry, Jim. <laughs> um, okay, and there's one more, I think. Uh, oh, you can show it, okay. So what we would like to highlight here is we, um, Megan did a great job of um, kind of explaining all of those um, different um, student populations, the L population, the REL population, the ever L. And then of course there's never L students like me who enter the system speaking English, only English, the little German accent here and there, but only English. Um, and so didn't need, never needed ESOL services, right? Um, so, what you'll see with our MCAP data, it, um, both at the elementary and we'll show you secondary, is our L students, um, they're, they're struggling with proficiency, right? This is MCAP um, elementary data um, with English. English is their second language. Even when we're talking about math, there's a lot of language in a math classroom. So they are struggling to meet um, proficiency. But then when we get, and these, the colors look a little off to me, but I don't know if they do. <laughs> I'm wondering if it's because it's imported. So we'll have to fix the colors because they don't match the key. Yeah, we so the L proficient is the um, is the lowest, unfortunately, right? So um, and then the next one should be never L. And then the next one is REL and the last one is ever L. So what you'll see, for example, in math in the third grade are REL's are outperforming every other student group, right? Um, so, so the RELs would be here, they're outperforming every other student group. Um, what you'll see normally, um, you know, the ever RELs are doing very well, right? Um, and often better than the never RELs, right? So we know a couple of things. We know that bilingualism is a great asset for the cognitive development. So as students are le learning multiple languages, they're building their cognition. Um, so this isn't surprising, but I think what Megan's, Megan mentioned earlier is often all we focus on are the current L's and the deficit, right? That gap right there. And we don't tell the whole story that yes, they're struggling to meet with proficiency, but they're also learning English. And as they become proficient, they become much more successful. Next slide. Can I just, Aaron, just make sure I understand. So when you say never L's, so I was a never L, like so. Yeah, a native English speaker. Okay. So your RELs mm -hmm. are outperforming our children who are Sometimes. speaking too. So this is the secondary. So um and yes, no, that is what she was saying. This is right. the secondary. So, but that is what wait I minute, said. Aaron. Could you just pause a second? Right, so what's uh, an important piece to recognize, and thank you, uh, Ms. Lickner, for calling that out for us, because what we see is students who, when they do receive the service, and they follow it all the way through, and then they um, exit after the two years when they're RELs, that uh, they actually go on to be high academic performers in general. I mean, as Aaron was saying, there's, there's some, um, Others, you know, there's some variance naturally, but that we do see the service actually really does help accelerate and propel those students to high academic success. So, Aaron and Megan, I'll turn it over. So, thanks for the opportunity. No, and if if Jim, you wanted to go back a slide, <laughs> um, just Jane, because I didn't point this out, and it might be helpful. When when I first saw the math third grade math data and how the rels are outperforming. So those are the kids who just exited in two years. I had a little aha. If you've exited ESOL by the third grade, that means you've acquired a second language fairly quickly, which probably also means you're gifted. 
And so I can see why that they would do so well in, in that category. And we know language and math is also connected in many ways. So I think that is also why you're seeing that huge spike in third grade for math. What we typically see, right, is RELs are doing pretty well and ever else are doing as good, if not better, than um, the kids who never needed ESL services. So if we go to the sec um, next slide, you'll see similar data. It's not quite, you know, um, as dramatic as that third grade one. Um, but again, the lowest is the, L, the current Ls who are proficient. So this is the number of Ls who are proficient in Algebra 1 um, and English 6, uh, all of those. And then the never Ls are the next one, RELs are the next, and then the ever Ls, I don't know why they're not um, showing up in the red color, but they would be the red color. Okay, next slide. So we see something similar with graduation rate. So again, the English learner graduation rate is unacceptable. It is quite low, um, but the students are still in the process of acquiring English. Um, they haven't exited the program yet. Um, so their, their um, graduation rate is low. Um, conversely, or similarly, their dropout rate is quite high, which is very, extremely problemat problematic. But then again, what you're looking at now is the REL and the EverL. So once they're reclassified, they have very high graduation rates. And once they, and st any student who is ever an English learner, also, but has exited the program completely, is also, also has a very high graduation rate. Define EverL again for me. Ever L is anyone who was in ESOL at some point. At any point. But it's been more than two years. So the RELs are the students that we have to monitor for two years to make sure they're continuing to do well and they, they come back in our data also. Ever Ls are just um, students who at some point were in ESOL but have graduated out of ESOL. Okay, thanks. And at, we as a uh, ESOL coordinators across the state have been asking for this information from the state for many years because we knew this was the story, but it wasn't being shown this way. And, and if I can, um, as board members, you sometimes have an opportunity to advocate in legislative sessions or at state levels. And one of the things that this really illustrates is that a four year cohort for a student receiving ESOL services is not reflective of their capacity and their and their ability. And so that's another part of where this data tells a different story that when students are given the time they need, because as Aaron also showed you in some of that data, for students who arrive in this country in the ninth grade, there isn't enough time in the span that they have for them to both acquire that language and be able to demonstrate that proficiency. But this data shows us that when given time and given that service, they are able to, in many cases, outperform students. Um, so I just wanted to offer that note because you in your role have opportunities that sometimes we don't. Um, and so that's another context of this data that really tells a more full picture of the abilities and talents of our students. Thank you, Megan. Next slide. And I think I turn it over to Jen Hernandez here. Is that correct? Next slide, Jim. Oh, okay. This is uh, um, now we're going to talk a little bit of how we are serving our English learners. And next slide, Jim. Uh, and to note, um, because we're in the budget process, um, so we have different funding sources. So operating funds are obviously very important, um, especially for staffing. Um, we also have Title III funds. So the Title III federal grant is, I believe, the smallest federal grant. Um, it has grown over the years in Baltimore County because our population continues to grow. Um, so we get, um, every year we get um, one initial uh, allocation based on that October 31st number I, we shared with you earlier. And then in January, we'll get another um, amount potentially for immigrant. And there's a very complicated formula. And so some years you don't get anything and some years you get a lot. The past two years, the grant for the entire state is about $1.3 million. And Baltimore County has gotten a million of it for the past two years. 
over a million, which means we've had the highest past Montgomery County, past PG County. We've had the highest growth in immigrants in our county, um, which is huge because some years I've gotten like 16,000. <laughs> so, um, and then the other thing that's really great is we do collaborate with the Title II office. I will say that in a lot of my colleagues in other counties, don't necessarily get Title II funds. And so um, we've always ha gotten a good portion of Title II funds to support professional development as well. And can I add a plug here around the um, operating budget as a funding source? Um, the budget request is also the only source of staffing for ESAW. So um, you're probably aware that there's a formula for staffing that comes with enrollment, and there is a formula of funding within that enrollment number that gives differential funding uh, for staff for special education. It's built in to the formula for enrollment. That is not the case for ESAW. And so the only positions that we get for ESAW comes through that budget request in the operating budget. So as you're thinking about that budget request uh, you recently got, um, that's the only way that we get positions for ESOL. There is no formula built in just by virtue of enrollment, even though we have 11,000 plus students enrolling and continuing to enroll throughout the year. So um, that's just another example of how sometimes the current posture or current models do not reflect the students that we're serving um, as they enroll. So I just wanted to put in that plug. Thank you. Okay, next slide. So now I will turn it over to Jenna Hernandez, who will talk a little bit about our academic programs. Thanks, Erin. Next slide, please, Jim. Thank you. So you heard a little bit about our programming models. And so at the elementary level, we operate a cluster model where English learners can attend their home schools and receive their ESOL services there. Um, we do a lot of work as an office in terms of the alignment of teacher schedules. Um, again, those fluctuate due to different enrollment changes or things that may um, that may crop up within a cluster. Um, at the secondary level, we do run, as um, Dr. Sullivan mentioned earlier, the center model. Um, and we are making a transition in our ESOL strategic plan um, away from a center centralized model. Um, but again, in the center model, students are taking a full schedule of classes, um, including one or more ESOL classes, again, depending on their proficiency level. So again, at the secondary level, we're really looking to shift away from that center model um, just so that students have more access to after school and other programming options. And then that will help address some of the waiver issues that that, um, we've shared with you a little bit earlier. Next slide, please. And oh, if I can, Jen, just while you're transitioning, later in the program, we're going to really unpack that strategic plan around moving away from the center model, so you'll get a lot more information about that. I, I knew where you were going to go with that. Um, but I also want to connect the dots, and I should have when I talked about the budget. Um, so, so far, we've um, surfaced a couple of situations. If we think about those equity questions that Mr. Handy posed in front of us, when you think about who are the underrepresented groups af affected by policy, when we talk about not having a staffing formula that supports our English learners, that's a perfect example of using that equity lens. So they are an underrepresented group that is negatively impacted by a policy that's somewhat antiquated. Um, and it does have other unintended consequences, which we're going to unpack when we connect the center model to the waiver data, the attendance data, and the dropout data. So I just wanted to plug those back in because Mr. Handy started with those equity questions, and you'll see them come up again very deliberately around the strategic plan. But even some of the examples we've already given about the models around funding and staff formulas um, and even enrollment numbers, i.e. our funding is based on an October 31 and we've already enrolled 300 students since that time. Um, these are all ways really when thinking about those equity questions, um, what are some of the barriers that we're working to try to disrupt? So we'll circle back to those again, but I just wanted to connect those dots. Thanks, Megan. Yes, so just to talk a little bit more about the elementary model. So we have teachers who work in a cluster model and students do receive services at the elementary um, level in their neighborhood school. And again, our office does create those itinerant teacher assignments, which is pretty challenging um, for us given the size of the county and our growing population. And there are different dynamics also within those assignments because some of our schools have over 200 multilingual learners and then there are some with as few as three. So um, again, it's a dynamic um, operation of making sure that we are staffed accordingly. Next slide, please. 
Looking a little bit more at the elementary ESOL instructional model, um, we've written curriculum for kindergarten and ESOL uh, fundamental curriculum for newcomers, and then we also offer traditional ESOL curricula for grades one through five. Again, during um, the pandemic, I think it's really important to note that we created um, an entire digital curricula as well. So our curricula strands are based in project based learning, so we really want students to build their proficiency and their social skills in that model. And um, again, we're looking to move students toward those higher levels of proficiency across the four domains of language, speaking, listening, reading and writing. And the co teaching model is a model where the ESOL teacher works in conjunction with the classroom teacher to help support that instruction. So again, there's a great partnership opportunity there. And again, we are continuing to try to move students toward that 4.5 um, WIDAS proficiency score. Next slide, please. So as Megan just mentioned, we are transitioning away from that centers model, and we're going to have a little bit more detail in the next couple um, slides throughout this presentation. But again, as um, Dr. Sullivan mentioned earlier, we do currently have centers at both the middle and high school levels, and you can see the different areas from where students are pulled. So again, if you think about some of those waivers and the waiver data telling us that, yes, yeah, students you know, and parents often don't want to be on a bus that long, um, you can see there's a pull from different areas where there's a significant travel time um, that is involved in getting to an ESOL center. And that's one of the things that we are seeking to address um, with a shift away from the center's model. Next slide, please. So looking at our secondary ESOL instructional model, one of the things to remember that's really important is that um, under federal law, ESOL students are required to be scheduled in English language development classes. We um, do in the office have a very robust secondary ESOL curricula that's designed to support that language development. Um, and again, we work very closely with our other content office partners to create some cross-curricular programming. Um, we're working on an American culture course with the Office of Social Studies. We're working on some ESOL mathematics courses. And one of the focus points for the Office of World Languages and ESOL is that we're working on identifying more of our multilingual learners um, to really help with tutoring and additional supports to help them earn that Maryland seal of biliteracy, which would recognize their biliteracy um, skills. So again, we have the sheltered instruction or the co-teaching model. Again, the co-teaching model is a collaborative effort with the ESOL teacher co-planning, co-teaching and supporting. And then we have sheltered instruction where the ESOL teacher is working with English learners um, using our developed content curricula and then working through those different proficiency development levels, again, across speaking, listening, reading, and writing. Next slide, please. One of the important pieces um, that we have found is the summer programming to again continue the development, the English language development process for our students. So we as an office support the design, the hiring of teachers, the planning and the implementation of our summer programs um, with our staff in the office. We seek to provide additional support again for intensive summer language opportunities for students, um, really looking at some of our beginning proficiency levels. And one of the things um, that you'll see is that as we're working through the summer programming, we are also adding in some great things that students love, like a soccer without borders that helps them um, build community and build some confidence and have some study skills or even some art electives that are available during the summer. Next slide, please. As we talked about, um, and Aaron mentioned it, about the third grade, how we see that spike in achievement often, the bilingual elementary summer program, again, looking at the power of bilingualism, we've been offering this at select elementary schools. Again, really looking for that 50-50 split of 50% native Spanish speaking students and perhaps non, um, non uh, Spanish speaking students. And so again, building community, building engaging activities where instruction is provided in English and Spanish. So we're using a certified ESOL teacher and a certified Spanish teacher to help run this program. And again, it's really an amazing benefit for students to have um, the opportunity to be in a bilingual environment. And again, helping students move toward earning that Maryland seal of biliteracy. Next slide, please. 
I am going to turn it over to um, Aaron, I believe at this time to discuss with you some of our family engagement opportunities. Okay, thank you. Next slide, Jim. <clears throat> and, uh, I think there's an end. Thank you. Um, so uh, these are just some photos of our ESA Welcome Center, which has moved several times over the years. We're currently in the Cadenceville Administration Building, and here's um, some some of the kids who and who are wearing some of the backpacks that we give them when they come through the Welcome Center. Next slide, please. Um, so Megan talked a lot about this, but if they've been identified as um, being exposed to another language at home um, and they're new to the country or new to the state, they come to the Welcome Center. If they're a Maryland transfer, they do not because we already have the information. They've already been assessed um, and we can get that information from our, our partners. Next slide. The, um, so here's another data graph, but what we want to show you is um, the number of Welcome Center appointments. So <clears throat> um, 2019 and 20 and 2020, 21 were not um, very consistent because of the pandemic, um, but you can start seeing. So if you look at 2018 and 19, which was like our last full year before the pandemic, and then kind of skip two years and look at 21, 22, and then this year, um, what you'll see is the number of appointments at the Welcome Center continues to grow. Um, but what is really important is as of today, we're at almost 2,000 appointments for the entire year. It's January 19th. Um, so we have until June 30th to collect more data. That's like off the charts, how many appointments we've had this year. Um, and the other thing that is important to note is the before September 30th and the after September 30th. We know the September 30th count is the count for the system as a whole, right? Um, so all of these student enrollments after that time aren't being counted into our general fund either um, in for funding purposes, but also how challenging that is for schools and families and students when they're arriving throughout the year um, they don't just come at the beginning of the year, they come all year long. And so that really does take a lot of work on the school's part. Um, and so we really seek to try to provide as much support as we can at the Welcome Center to at least give them a good start to Baltimore County. Next slide, please. We, we try to provide a lot of services at the Welcome Center. Um, I will share with you sometimes when, our, when it's crazy, some of them like completing the meal benefit form unfortunately doesn't happen. Um, but um, we, our philosophy is it's not so easy to get to the Keynesville Administration Building if you're from Dundalk. Um, and so when they come to us, we really believe that we need to provide a good service to the family. But we also believe that we need to provide a good service to the schools. We have a lot of linguistic and cultural um, expertise in our office, and we want to make sure that we're supporting the schools and the families in that transition. Next slide, please. Here are some of the cute kids. <laughs> they were actually um, all pre-K kids and kindergarten kids. Um, and kindergarten kids, we don't usually assess at the Welcome Center, but I happened to be that day, there that day. So I said, guess what? They're here. We're going to assess them all. Took a long time, but they're very adorable. So, and, and then I gave them all a soccer ball. <laughs> So the only welcome Next center slide, we have is at Catonsville. We just have we don't have anything on the um, east side of the county. We do not, but we're going to talk about the mobile welcome center in a little bit. Okay. But that is true. Yes. Yeah. Next slide, please. We also really, um, from the support of funding, um, we've been able to really. Um, provide a lot of translation and interpreting services. We have a large um, contractual interpreter um, uh, group um, who represent 23 languages, our top 23 languages. Um, but when we aren't able to provide a, a person, we also have the telephonic interpreting services. Um, we also have translations. And we should add that there's now a, a bilingual senior communication specialist who came from my office, um, but now it's an office of communications. And so you'll now see that things are coming out in Spanish as well as English from um, like the system wide messages. Next slide, please. 
We try to do a lot of different parent outreach. Um, some of this is funded through my grant. A lot of this is funded through my Title III grant. Um, we have an International Parent Leadership Academy where we bring in families who are new to the district, who, you know, um, are new to an American school system. It's very confusing. It's a huge system. We're trying to train, like teach them about what it, what what is, what do we offer? Right, and what should their children have access to? When we're talking about equity, a lot of our equity issues are that our, the parents, if they if they don't know what they should have access to, then they don't know what to advocate for. And so the goal of the International Parent Leadership Academy is to really allow them to start to ad advocate for themselves, give them the information so they can advocate in the ways that they seek to advocate for themselves, um, and, but give them that opportunity. Uh, so that's the International Parent Leadership Academy. We also do parent workshops. Parent, family reunification is about families who have been um, separated. The data on how many of our families who have been separated for very long periods of time is a lot, is very overwhelming. Um, so that's a program to try to help bridge that gap. Um, and then we do some welcoming events too. Next slide, please. And now I'll turn it over to Jen, back to Jen for professional development. Thanks, Erin. So just to give you some background, and um, we've talked a little bit about how we support families, the Welcome Center, how we support students academically, but we also provide a lot of ongoing um, robust professional development opportunities, not just for our ESOL teachers, but for um, our content area colleagues, for um, building leaders, and for anybody really to help support best instructional practices for working with our multilingual learners. Um, this includes things like we will present to department chairs um, in other content areas, working with the magnet um, programming and advanced academics offices to help ensure um, that we are um, providing additional supports to English learners in those programs. Yep, um, we sorry, also right have, now sorry, have a focus I? on training on the Elevation platform, which is our new platform that we um, we are using, which is very robust and has everything from professional learning modules to additional supports and data for our multilingual learners. Um, we also are working through some PSYOP training, which is the Structured Instructional Observation Protocol, which is a really wonderful training, and it really talks about um, supports that are good for all students, not just just for multilingual learners. So this is just a sample of some of the different trainings that we provide. Um, so you can see that although we are a small office, we do provide a lot of supports to help with this growing number of our students. Um, one of the challenges that we have is really going through a very full-fledged training with many of our teachers as new teachers are coming to us. Um, ESOL coursework is not always required to become a certified general education teacher. So um, talking to to our new teachers and others in the profession about linguistics and how languages are learned is a really important part of some of the professional learning work um, that we support. So I'm going to next turn it over. Next slide, please, Jim. Back to Megan. Erin, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I just wanted to say in the same context that Megan was sharing before, the, uh, if the it's really significant that in the state of Maryland, there's no required training for teachers to work to um, to learn how to work with English learners before they come to Baltimore County to any school system in Maryland. Most states, especially with the population that we have, have required trainings for teachers to finish a teacher certification program. And so we have been advocating for those changes at the state for many years. Um, some schools are starting to take the lead on it themselves, college of uh, some education schools, but it, that's a real deficit because then it falls on our, us as a county to provide all of the training to the new teachers, to the teachers who are arriving. And so in again, if you're in a forum to advocate, we really need teachers to have to have some training before they become certified teachers. Okay, so I know that we've um we we started late, but it is also getting late. So I want to make sure we get to some of the other questions. So I'm going to go quickly just to talk about where we are and where we're going next. Next slide, um, because I think this will also lead into an opportunity for you, you board members to ask us questions. Um, so when we talk about centering those equity questions in our work, it really is the driver for the information I'm going to share next around our strategic plan. So you heard us talk about um 
how we involve. So one of the equity questions talks specifically about um, question three, I believe. How have you intentionally involved stakeholders that are a member of that community? So Aaron mentioned the International Parent Leadership Academy. Um, we've also talked directly to every family that waives service. We have a conversation and we have folks outreach to find out why. Um, Jim, can you advance to the next slide? And when you think of those first two questions, when it's thinking about, um, again, what is the policy or program in place that is having a significantly differential impact or unintended consequence for our students? So there was a time when the design around our secondary schools in having a center model for providing support was intended to flood resources in one community. And so when at a time in our district, you might have had two multilingual learners at one high school and two at another, it made sense to have them come together so that we could flood our resources to support them. When you think through the lens of those equity questions, that policy or program decision no longer services our students. We have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of students spread across all of our communities. And so it's important that we center that equity lens to think about the barriers that we, by virtue of that model, are putting for families. And families are involved in that conversation and they're telling us through their waiver data that it wasn't working for them. So we have a strategic plan. Next slide. So we are working to have a model where every student K through 12 would receive their English learner services at their home school. We know this will improve attendance. We believe it will improve outcomes and as well as providing our students opportunity to participate in the fullness of things like sports and extracurricular activities. Um, can you advance, Jim? I know I'm talking fast, but and so we want to make sure that we increase opportunities to access to after school. We also want to reduce those waived services and support transportation. Um, but we also want to make sure that our schools look like the community that they serve. And so we are proud of the diversity that we have in Baltimore County. And we want to make sure that our schools reflect that as well. Next slide. And so thinking about those equity questions, they really center some of the decision making that we've made. Um, so I'm going to ask you, I'm sorry, Jim, can you advance to the next slide again? There we go. So we have met each of the schools. So again, thinking of that question three about how do you intentionally involve stakeholders, um, we did use the data that we've shared previously. So enrollment data as well as waiver data to identify schools that would go first. So what you see in front of you are the um, seven middle schools that beginning with school year 23-24 will serve their own English learners that are zoned for that school. Um, in preparation for that, we have met with every school that we're gonna identify both in middle and in high. Uh, we met with the principal and with their leadership teams. We've designed specific professional learning plans um, for that school, some of which start on Monday on January 23rd and then also bookend in April. Um, and as well as we have provided master scheduling resources support um, and coaching support from the office, as well as um, parent family school liaisons. So these are the seven middle schools that that data identified um, would go first, both because of the number of students that they serve and also the number of students that had waived service that are currently in those buildings and not receiving service. And so what those families told us is that they would rather stay in their home school, even if it meant they had to waive service. Next slide. These are the high schools that we have identified, again, by the same um, data, um, and again, using that same model. So uh, through a combination of professional learning around some of those instructional strategies, as well as training the front office secretary, the enrollment liaisons, the guidance counselors, how do we make sure that these communities are poised to welcome these families and to support the needs of their students? Next slide. And so then you can see we have a TBD for year two because that data is constantly changing. And so we um, all of our principals and system leaders are aware of this initiative and this focus and this goal from our equity lens. Um, but we are identifying schools through real time data to make sure that we are um, serving the best students. Our vision is that by the time we get to year three, we would be poised then that everybody um, would be in that school. Of course, that we know that part of the planning is talking to students and their families. Um, I talked a little bit about scheduling and staffing. So as we move to this model, we will have some reallocation of the staffing we already have, um, because as students, um, for example, are no longer at Dumbarton because they are being served at Cockeysville, Primarily, we will start by reallocating staff, um, but we also need more staff. We know that we need to reduce our ratio for support. 
And as we've already illustrated, the needs of secondary students can be um, very challenging because oftentimes they come to us with gaps in their formal education, um, and they also have much more complex content that we're trying to get them to learn. So each of the individual school meetings that we had with um, the principals talked about their community, their needs, and some of those staffing pieces. We also developed communication resources, both within the school, but also for the families and professional development. So next slide, the families um, actually have um, some choice. So for incoming sixth and ninth graders, they will automatically attend their home school. So if you are zoned for Cockeysville, whether you are an English learner or a never L, um, you would just be a part of the regular registration process for your zone school. And that's true as well at the high school for those high schools that we identified. If you are a current student who is currently attending a center and zoned for that school, you're being given the choice. We wanna honor our families and students. So if I am a parent and I have a student who's currently, I'm zoned for Cockeysville, but my child has been at Dumbarton in order to receive services as a sixth or seventh grader, I might choose that I wanna stay at Dumbarton for my eighth grade year. Um, alternatively, if I have another child coming up from fifth grade, I might want both of my students to be in our neighborhood community school. So so we're allowing our students, um, families to make the choice that's best for them. And we're continuing to do outreach to these individual families and then communicate to schools. So they have almost a weekly data pool in our system to see what choices families have made so that they can plan from them. We also are going to students directly in those neighborhood schools that are already there and are there because they waived service and we're asking them if they want to make a different decision now that they can opt to have service while still staying in that home school. And then moving forward, any new enrollees uh, beginning in June 30th would not have the choice. They would just enroll in their school of enrollment and receive their ESOL services there. Next slide. I'm going to um, skip this part other than to say hopefully we can come back another time to do a deeper dive around professional learning, but just know that as I mentioned, we're trying to hit many different layers of the school and the community to make sure that we're poised to do the best job for these um, students new to this community. Next slide. OK, then I'm going to go back to the question about the Esau Welcome Center, and I'm going to turn it back to Dr. Sullivan, really framing through again, uh, what are the barriers? So we have this wonderful Welcome Center, but it's all the way in Catonsville, which if you live in Dundalk might as well be Venus. Um, so Dr. Sullivan can talk about a way that we're trying to mitigate that barrier with our new mobile Esau Welcome Center, and then we'll open it for questions. So, um, so that's exactly right. Um, we recognize that we live in a big county, both um, population and geographically, and it is can be very challenging, um, especially for our families who may not have transportation or and and then maybe need to take off the entire day to get to um, a location on the west side. Um, and so we've been working on this process for a long time um, to have a mobile welcome center that really could both serve as um, a, a way to eliminate those transportation building barriers, but also not only can we do registration, but also that we could do additional community programming um, and we could do things like pop-up immunization clinics. So um, next slide, Jim. Um, so you will see that we have, um, uh, We've designed it in a way that there's a space for testing, there's a space for a nurse, there's a space for a PPW. Um, we also, you can see from the picture, there's a big screen on the outside and we'll have, so on nice days we'll have chairs and we'll be able to do outdoor um, activities with the awning and, and, well, you can't see the screen, but there is a screen now, um, <laughs> that we will be able to do activities and parent engagement. Next slide, Jim. So again, so we have a waiting area, it has monitors, we have a flexible space, so it can either be for testing or for small parent presentations, maybe after the COVID spikes. Um, we have the PPW and nursing station and that outside monitor. But this really, and right now we're in the very last stage, students at Kenwood High School are working on the wrap. Um, everything else has been completed, we have a driver. Um, and so we're really, and, and part of what we've started to do this year is provide evening appointments, Saturday appointments, right? Because nine to four doesn't work for everyone. Um, and that's another opportunity with the ESOL Welcome Center that we can do things in the evening to really try to reduce some of the barriers. Um, because 
we believe in the that it's important for them to come to us so that we can give that well they have to be tested um, but also in order to give get as much information from them so we can give the school as much as much information as possible too but we also know how difficult it can be so this is one attempt to to lower a barrier next slide um yeah okay so uh, the I just want to reference really quickly the blueprint for Maryland's future, the blueprint print, which we all know. Um, after the blueprint was initially um, written, they came up with a work group. There's a lot of um, animation, just click on through. Um, so there's the, the work group for English learners. And so, um, which was led um, by the state superintendent, he chaired this work group. Um, and so there have been a lot of really great recommendations that have come from it, um, which um, a lot, we also hope there will be a lot of support from the state because what they're asking for will have help us make great gains for our students. Um, but we but we also hope that there is some guidance around some of these um, uh, recommendations. So um, there's like eight more bullets, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, so some of them you'll see like they're talking about a bilingual teacher certification, which is interesting because we don't that ESOL piece, um, teacher pipeline, the two-way immersion. Jen talked a little bit about dual immersion programs. We know that the state is very um, much looking at creating more dual language programs. We have been looking at that too. Um, and so some of the work we're doing aligns to that. Also looking at those youngest learners, how you teach a kindergarten English is very different than how you teach a ninth grader English. Um, and it's important that we recognize that. and. Um, and we provide the right support for that as well. So that's another big piece. So um, there's a lot of great stuff coming forward um, from the state as well. Next slide. So we really want to just thank you. We know we got um, started a little late. We know we give you a lot of information. Uh, we tried to um, really paint uh, a broad picture of the students that we support knowing that um, and and Mr. Hindi and Dr. Yarbrough, thank you for letting us have the equity committee agenda to talk about this really important piece. Uh, we hope even though we talked a lot, we'll be able to come back and talk even more because we could talk about this all day, <laughs> um, but we do want to um, thank you and um, certainly uh, turn it back to Dr. McComas or Dr. Yarbrough, Mr. Handy to facilitate any questions board members have um, because we want to support you in um, in your work. So thank you. So thank you so much for that extremely comprehensive presentation. Um, I think um, Ms. Harvey joined us during the meeting. So um, thanks, Robin, for um, logging on. We know you had another meeting. Um, Robin or Brenda, do you have any questions um, based on the presentation? Um, not at this time. Um, Brenda, I don't think you what you do you have any questions? No, it was very thorough. Okay. Got a lot I of just, information. I just have the one presentation question. presentation was very good. Yes. It was. Um, in our budget, in the budget proposal, there isn't an additional, I don't have my new Bible with me, but there is an addition 36. of ESOL um, teachers that is 36. being 36. 36. Is that to support the move to the school, back to school base for those seven or eight middle schools and high schools? Is that what the intent of those teachers are? So I'll are? start and then I'll invite, oh, go ahead, Mary. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so um, exactly, that's exactly what that request is for, so that as students are matriculating to their home school, um, which part of lowering, you know, part of the excitement around that is not only are we, um, shifting the model in a way that will better serve our students. Part of what's better serving them is they'll be um, able to access after school activities, athletics, all of those supports that today in the center, they have to get right on that bus and get home and get all the way across the county to where they live. And so right now um, they're not as able to be connected. Um, so in order to support our students matriculating to their home school, uh, we need to have ESOL teachers there to support their uh, success. And so those additional ESOL teachers are requested to support that decentering process. Um, and again, as, as Megan explained earlier, it's really important to understand in your role around the budget process um, that those ESOL teachers only come as a standalone request. They are not part of our normal growth 
uh, enrollment. Um, and and again, there is that formula for normal growth. So what I mean by that is, and I don't have the exact formula that the county government uses um, as part of our our budget process, uh, but it, it um, oversimplifying, but like if we get every, you know, for every 30 students, we get an additional FTE. Um, that's what I mean by a baked in formula. We have a formula like that for special education. However many special education students we get um, above what we had, we would be allotted an extra special educator. There is nothing like that for ESOL, which is part of why we are really um, we have been for many years behind in the staffing that we truly need for this, the number of students that we have. So um, I hope that I didn't overcomplicate that for you, but those uh, bottom line is those those FTEs that we're requesting are directly supporting this decentering process that students can be in their home school and have full access to not just their uh, English learner supports, but full access to all the resources that are offered in their home school. And if their home school is a community school, have access to all those resources as well. Can I add to that response? Mm -hmm. Everything Dr. McComa said, and I just want to make sure that I'm clear for, I think we have three viewers. Um, we also need those positions. So Dr. McComas is exactly right that um, the move back to home schools can't happen without additional positions because we would just be further taxing the resources. And we need those positions to uh, address the enrollment growth that um, Dr. Sullivan referenced. And the reason I'm adding that piece is because all 36 are not going just to those middle and high schools we identified. We also will use those positions to help reduce the ratio across the board. So she's absolutely right. We can't do the decentering without positions or it would be extremely taxing on the resources we have. Um, but I'm sure some of the principals of, you know, Franklin High thinks he's uh, he's not going to get 36 positions. <laughs> we have to share with with elementary to to help with our ratio as well. So it's across the board. Okay, thanks. Yeah, because with the 13 D center center back to the schools and 36, it sounds like there's you're, we're spreading them pretty thin. Yeah. So our current um, just to try to add some data. I know. Um, we love data. Um, the current ratio, even though there is not a national or state specific mandated ratio, I know sometimes that helps us to put that frame in the ratio and the current ratio is 54 to one. Um, if we didn't get any mm. positions, that ratio would go to well over 61 to one, um, which is really very challenging. So um, with the projections that we have, um, the additional positions will help us bring that ratio down um, to 52 to one. Um, and that's an average. So elementary ratio would actually be a little bit bigger um, and secondary would be at 51 to one. And, and that sounds maybe counterintuitive to how we typically think of ratios in terms of staffing. We often think about smaller classes in, in the primary grades, but for ESOL, as we mentioned, the staffing needs and the ratio at secondary because of the wide ranges of courses and different programs and graduation requirements, as well as the fact that our students come in at very different Different levels um, and oftentimes the needs of those students um, don't align at all to what's happening at that grade level. So when you think about all kindergartners are learning to read, while well, there's a differential need for a multilingual learner, whereas a newcomer in ninth grade has a very distinct set. So um, yes, we need, we're already spread thin, as Dr. McComas said, we were already behind um, and now we need to try to accelerate to, to catch up. But that's our goal is to to keep those ratios from uh, going up as we continue to see increases in enrollment. Thank you. Um, Brenda or Robin, anything else? Uh, yes, exactly. How many uh, ESOL uh, students are currently enrolled? What's the population of ESOL students? As of today, it's around 11,380. I think it's up from the 360 that we showed earlier. So 11,000. We've been enrolled 11 since we made that slide a few days ago. <laughs> <Wow. That's> correct. <laughs> OK, all righty. And I know you said um, how the teaching staff for ESOL's teachers, you were um, out of whack with that. How many teachers do you have currently employed as ESOL teachers? 208 teacher, 208.5 FTE. I am sick, so I'm asking for repeats. I'm sorry. I'm not That's okay. No, we didn't <laughs> mention that. Okay. 
that's okay. a question. Um, okay, it was very thorough. So, uh, hi. Robin. This is Robin. Yeah, I have a question, and and mine is probably going to be redundant because I had technical difficulties and I was late to the meeting. Forgive me for that. Um, so we have two hundred and eight full time equivalent. We have 11,000 ESOL students. How many s that are receiving, are these ESOL eligible students or, or students who are receiving ESOL services? Service. Students receiving. They're receiving the services. And so all of these 11,000 students are receiving the services where? In elementary school, they receive their ESOL service in their school of enrollment. So just like that's they, what I thought. Yep, you're so correct. It's just middle 11, and high school. 000, right. What are the of the eleven thousand? What's the breakdown in terms of those the elementary students who are receiving them in their schools and the middle and high schoolers who would need to go to a center? So I'm gonna do I don't some have quick, the exact number, but it's I can about, do some quick math from it's the about we have six thousand um, elementary level. Okay. A little okay. bit more, sixty five hundred, I think. Okay. So you have about five thousand students that you're trying to redirect into community to their community school. Is that what I'm understanding? That is correct over the next correct. three years. So we're not doing all 5,000 at once, um, but we have identified some schools to start. That is the vision of the strategic plan over the next three years. Um, okay. And, some, and uh, some East all strategic plan. I'm sorry. I want to specify. Um, and so over the next three years, that is the vision that these 5,000 plus, and by then it will be more, will be serviced in their home school. For next year, we've identified schools that have the highest number. Um, I'm sure I can anticipate the next question will be, how many students are we moving next year? That's an okay. ongoing data point because as I mentioned, and, and forgive me because you may not have been here at that time, for students currently enrolled in those schools, we're giving them a choice. So families have a choice. So we will have that number of right. how many students made that choice. We just don't have it quite yet. Uh, of course, yeah, I did hear that part. That oh, okay, great. Uh, families get to decide whether yeah. they want to continue in the center or transition to their home school. Correct. Uh, yeah, I was just curious as to what the real lift is and then with the 36 additional teachers is that that that's our current we're request, looking yes. right the current request they are being deployed to these middle schools that we've identified that high have the highest numbers of esol students that we're trying to transition to their home schools uh and i i wasn't clear on is that the total alleg i think Yes, so Someone asked it, that, but I wasn't clear Sure, that th so that's where they all be going. They will not, not all 36 will go. So if, um, if we're lucky enough to get all 36 that we have requested all the way to the finish line, right now, given the projections we have, we would probably allocate 16 across the elementary schools just based on enrollment growth. Um, so that we can keep the elementary ratio to about 54 to 1, and then about 20 of those positions would go to those middle and high schools to support that transition. And remember, too, okay. some of the current positions at those centers will be reallocated to follow the students because as the center ESOL enrollment goes down because students have opted to go home, we can reallocate some of that staffing to go with it. Of and course, I, of course. And and to add that to that, actually, it is about 16 teachers that we're reallocating. So uh, 30, the new schools will be about 30. The new schools do need th around 36 teachers. Right. Yeah. OK, thank you okay, so thank much you. for that. I think we could keep talking all night. Robin, did you have another question? Robin, no, ma'am. No, ma'am. OK. Um, all right, so I'm going to move on, but I'm going to thank you guys again. I mean, that that was a lot of information and it really does help us as we look at the budget piece to understand that 36 teachers and, and um, where it may be going and what the need is. So the next piece on the agenda was equity committee topics introduced by Mr. Doug Handy. So 
I don't know if we want to postpone that to the next meeting or we need to talk about it now because we don't have an agenda for the next meeting. But what do you um, what do you think, Mr. Hamby? Yeah, thank you, Ms. Lecter. You, um, you were right in line with what I was thinking. Could we um, we actually do have times prepared, but I would just say in the interest of time, if uh, we can defer that until next meeting, I'd be glad okay. to present at that time. OK, um, Brenda, are you OK with that as chair? Yes, that's fine. OK, then um, the last item on the agenda is announcements and the next equity committee meeting will be held on Thursday, February 23rd at four o'clock. Um, the next equity council meeting with the now the next equity committee meeting with the equity council will be held on Thursday, March 9th at 530. So I guess part of our agenda on the 23rd will be the topics and then also I'm um, preparing for the equity council meeting, correct? Yeah. Yes, correct. OK, all right. Is there any further business? Hearing none, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you again for joining us and your cooperation as we um, work through our.